Hello and welcome to Round Table, deporting asylum seekers to Africa. No, not Britain in this case, but Denmark. And it's proving to be a big part of next month's election campaign. And again, it is Rwanda, just like the UK, although Britain hasn't actually sent anyone there yet. Can the Danes make the policy work despite international criticism? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. The European Commission criticised Denmark's Rwanda proposal for not being compatible with Denmark's legal obligations towards asylum seekers. In fact, Denmark passed a law last year that allows refugees arriving in Denmark to be moved to asylum centres in a partner country. It struck a $15 million deal with Kosovo to transfer 300 foreign detainees who are scheduled now to be deported. Rwanda could be the next stop. We have four guests on Roundtable today from Copenhagen. We have Charlotte Schlenter, who's Secretary General at the Danish Refugee Council in Sonderborg in Denmark. Ahmad Juma, author of While You Wait, advice for asylum seekers on how to deal with the waiting time. Been in Denmark uh, for more than 30 years. From Copenhagen, Dieter Brasso Sorensen, Senior Fellow at Europa and in Orebro, that is in Sweden. We have John Gustafsson, contributor at The Dispatch, formerly from the European Parliament, where he worked as a policy advisor. John, I'm going to come to you first. You are the only one out of our four guests on Roundtable today who seems to think this is a good idea. Why do you think it's a good idea? So there are several things that we have to understand here. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> the... Uh, migration crisis that we saw in 2015 uh, was only a prelude. Uh, this problem is not over. The number of migrants is going to increase um, in the future, especially as a result of climate change, as a result of people being displaced, uh, previously inhabitable areas becoming uninhabitable. And, um, and this is going to lead to estimates have ranged from uh, as much as you know 200 million to uh, over 1 billion. Uh, okay, so, so they need more people. help because they live in places that are going to be underwater or, or drought ridden be, rather than being shipped off to remote parts of Africa. That could be an argument. Absolutely, but what we have to understand is that we do not have the resources to welcome everybody here. That is simply not an option. Uh, the lifetime cost of a single refugee in my country in Sweden equals 290,000 US dollars. Uh, there is no country that has the kind of resources necessary to welcome all of the refugees. Well, if you welcome them, give them jobs and they pay their taxes, they pay for themselves. But Sweden and most European countries have very high barriers to the, to the labor market. This means that it takes several years, uh, if at all, for many, uh, for many migrants to join the labor markets. When they do join the labor markets, they typically join in work that is uh, subsidized, where they are not actually self-sufficient. They're still dependent on government welfare. Um, so, Have you got proof of that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, abso absolutely. I mean, this is uh, this is something that's been well that's been well documented, it's been well discussed during the uh, uh, during the. Uh, uh, I mean, the Swe Swedish um, uh, statistics aid agency has uh, uh, has data has data. Okay, so you well, say they don't pay for themselves, but but your claim that there are too many to take in. If we examine it a little bit, this is Denmark compared to Germany, 2021. Um, Denmark. 1,905 applications for asylum, 976 decisions, 36 of those were given asylum, 64% weren't. In Germany, just under 150,000, that is 80 times as many as in Denmark, and more of those, as a proportion, were given asylum than in Denmark. It can't be a problem if you've only got 2,000 in one year, can it? So Denmark's migration levels right now are quite low. And uh, I think this deal is important because it will allow uh, both Denmark and other countries that are following this route to continue to help greater numbers of asylum seekers than we can do if we continue to, uh, to allow everyone to resettle here. Because the same, uh, 
because the same, uh, uh, I mean, just in term, just in terms of cost, this far it's far cheaper to resettle somebody in another kind of, uh, in another country, especially once the scheme is actually up and running. I, I'm, I'm going to um, stop you there because I'm going to come back to you about Rwanda, and I want to bring the other guests yes. in Rwanda specifically in a little while. But I would let me come to you. Um, you've been in Denmark, as I say, for, for more than 30 years, 32 years. In fact, you say you were welcomed with open arms. Have things changed? Because you've written this book about how to deal with time that is wasted as an asylum seeker. Do you think the attitudes in Denmark have changed? Uh, certainly, yes. I mean, uh, Denmark over the, over the last 30 years has changed dramatically. Uh, De Denmark was known for its humanitarian faith and its attitude. But unfortunately now, Denmark is in the lead in, the, in, in, in discriminatory policies and laws against uh, foreigners, uh, refugees, and asylum seekers. So you have seen a 180 degree uh, change in, in, in the policy and the attitude of the Danish politicians. Can, can and, you and give me any examples of how there are laws discriminating against refugees and asylum seekers now in Denmark? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when the Syrians start, uh, began coming back in, in, in the 10, in the 12 and 13 and 14, uh, they made this what they called the jewelry law, smuggling in Danish, which said that the refugees coming to the Danish borders have to give up their jewelry or whatever money and, uh, and valuables they have. Uh, they have. So they, they, they gave them, uh, they, have to, they had to give them to the, to the government or the authorities. That Did they ever get them back? Asylum seekers. Uh, well, I, I don't uh, don't know if they got them back or, or how it went. I mean, this was a policy that was made as a kind of a symbolic policy to show that uh, Denmark was really mm -hmm. toughening up on the immigration asylum. So it was not so much a policy that was supposed to be implemented as such, but just really to give an impression that okay. Denmark is saying that. stop for the immigration. Charlotte, I will come to you because you work with refugees all the time to get your version of what happened with this jewellery order, if I may, in just a moment. But right now, I want to go to you, Dieter, and, and to ask you a little bit about the attitude across Europe as a whole. In, in Denmark, we understand this is playing big as an election issue. Is it growing, the opposition to asylum seekers staying in the country that they arrive in, in other countries as well? I mean, John's talking about Sweden, but uh, what about across Europe as a whole? Well, I think, I mean, if you look across uh, EU member states, this idea that um, for different reasons, but this idea that you should have uh, some kind of camps that are um, placed outside of the union is an idea that is gaining traction in, in some member states. So we've seen the Italian, uh, the newly elected Italian government has, has sort of indicated that they would be willing to look into um, to ideas such as this, uh, we've also seen it play out in the UK. I know they are no longer a member state, but still a European country. Um, and and I, I I I would my guess would be that we could also down the line uh, see other governments. Um, we've seen France uh, previously support ideas like this, and and Eastern European um, member states but as why well. Why do you think so, that's happening? If it is, why do you think people are turning against um, asylum seekers and migrants? Well. If, I think I, I'm. I wouldn't necessarily put it as if uh, people are turning against asylum seekers or, or migrants. I, I think uh, it was um, quite an awakening in 2015 and 16 when uh, Europe, as such, was um, met by an ab abnormal influx of migrants during the migrant crisis um, and refugee crisis. And I think what is on every every politicians across the board in Europe's mind now when you when you think of these issues is that the the Dublin regulation um, the basic the sort of the regulatory frame to to handle uh, migrants at, in the EU uh, was sort of de facto shown not to work. So, so it's and really it's, more down to the organisations, the the national organisations, the governments themselves, rather than um, what the migrants, what the refugees did to upset inhabitants of particular countries. It was a failure of the system, was it? Well, I think the failure of the system created fear not only among politicians, but also sort of anxiety in populations to say, well, these we saw these images of refugees uh, walking on highways and not having places to stay, and there, there weren't sufficient uh, housing in some, uh, especially sort of the Mediterranean European countries. Um, how to deal with, with the 
when when we are in the future again hit by a, a larger than the normal a number of refugees. So I think that sort of um, concern is not only sitting among politicians, yeah. that's also sitting in the general population. Charlotte, can, can I come to you? Sorry to interrupt you, um, Dita, but uh, we've got to get everybody in on this. Um, Charlotte, let me come to you and ask you about those refugees, migrants, asylum seekers. I know there are differences, but I'm, I'm putting everybody together. Is How are they treated in Denmark? How many of them are there? How many could possibly be going to Rwanda? What are the figures? I mean, uh, we don't know how many would be going to Rwanda because first and foremost, there is no formal agreement with Rwanda uh, yet. But there is a large majority in the Danish parliament who actually voted for an amendment to the Aliens Act in Denmark that actually paves the way for such a model to be put in place. We know that there have been negotiations uh, with Rwandan authorities over the last uh, year or so. Any idea how much Rwanda that, would be paid? Uh, no, I don't know the figures. We don't know about that. But we know that uh, Danish Development uh, Corporation is used to incentivize such a model to uh, to be put in in uh, in, in function. Uh, Kosovo reportedly paid fifteen million dollars. Three hundred foreign detainees scheduled to be deported hasn't happened yet. So you can maybe think along those lines in terms of financing for for Rwanda. What about the refugees who are? with you at the moment? How are they treated by Danish authorities? I think we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years that the asylum policies in, uh, in Denmark have become uh, stricter. Uh, and that is, uh, there has been a majority of politicians supporting uh, these stricter asylum policies in, uh, in Denmark. And that has, you know, a number of implications. But one is, uh, one of these implications is that the uh, temporariness of residence permits uh, has been uh, pronounced. Did they get their jewellery back? I was talking about this, this law when they came to the country being stripped of their possessions at the border, which I have to say I, I'd never heard of before. Did they get those back? I mean, it was called, I think, the jewellery policy, but basically it was about whether you had possessed uh, either money or other issues uh, uh, of, of, of value. Uh, you were not granted the same access to uh, to um, to support from the Danish uh, system. Okay, can, was, I, can uh, I read this out from Denmark's uh, Minister for Immigration mm -hmm. and Integration, who wrote, we are working hard to create a more fair asylum system. We're slowly but steadily moving closer. At the same time, it is important that we do not rush anything through, but instead ensure thoroughness in reaching an agreement in line with Denmark and Rwanda's international obligations, which is essential to both countries. John Gustafsson, you, you support this policy, but if you see things like migrants, refugees, um, being stripped of their possessions of their jewellery when they come into a country, that doesn't sound particularly fair to me. No, I agree. I agree with that. Um... And I also agree that there have been systemic failures when it comes to migration. I am not blaming individual migrants for everything that has gone wrong. But I am stating, as a matter of fact, that there is no system in the world that can deal with an unlimited number of migration or with the number of migrations that we have faced in the past 20 years or and will face over the next 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. uh, as, well, I mentioned climate change, but there's also... But, the but fact why that send them to Rwanda? Why send them to Rwanda? I mean, you call it um, the Singapore of Africa, but not many people would, would do that. I think when you look at uh, Rwanda's... Uh, I mean, most people associate Rwanda with the genocide, uh, obviously. But uh, ever since then, Rwanda has made tremendous progress. It's a fast-growing uh, country. It's a country that's growing at levels of, uh, that we associate with China and the, uh, the Asian tigers. Uh, it is a regional trade hub now for sub-Saharan sub Africa. Well, let, 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 no... Sorry, let me put this. I'm going to interrupt you there because, yes, it has been growing, but a lot of people suggest it's been growing merely um, to make rich those people who are corrupt within the country. And we referred to the British case of trying to get asylum seekers out to Rwanda. There's a high court case in the UK going on at the moment. And the barrister representing those asylum seekers um, describes it in this way, it's a regime, this is Rwanda, that repeatedly imprisons, tortures and murders those it thinks is its political opponents. All of those observations are drawn from our own government officials. It is not 
a country you'd want to go to to stay for any length of time if you had a choice, probably. So I want to say that according to Transparency International, uh, the Corruption Perceptions Index, uh, Rwanda is ranking better than Italy, it's ranking better than Malta, it's ranking better than Slovakia. These are not countries that are, you know, human rights hellholes. Rwanda has problems. They've been going in the right direction. And with our help and with our monitoring, they will continue on that path, I'm certain. But it's also important to note that no one is suggesting that all the world's refugees, and there are, you know, depending on the measure, at least 70 million of them, uh, no one is suggesting that all the world's refugees should end up specifically in Rwanda. But what we're doing is building a new model for migration where people uh, can receive asylum in safe areas, not perfect areas, but in safe areas, in safe countries, closer yeah. to where to where they to where. Let, they let's came, ask Awad, who, who works with um, asylum seekers and migrants and has written this book, whether what John is suggesting there is is fair at all. That it is a safe country. That there are checks and balances in place to make sure that there are no human rights abuses. Do you think that? Um, first of all, is beholden upon the Danish government to make sure that is the case. And secondly, is it likely to be free and fair and um, everything that you would want it to be? Well, I think it is incumbent upon uh, the Danish government to make sure that whatever they, wherever they place the, these asylum seekers, that it's a safe place. Unfortunately, we already know what's happening in Rwanda because using Rwanda as a place to settle re refugees and asylum seekers is already taking place. And Israel is one of the main countries who are actually using Rwanda to place their asylum seekers. And they already have a lot of uh, uh, lawsuits uh, because of uh, abuses of human rights. So we know that's already happening and other countries are using them. I think um, the, the whole argument about uh, there are so many refugees and that Europe has a refugee crisis is really misplaced and placed on the assumptions that we really have a, a European refugee crisis. The real refugee crises are taking place in the local areas of conflict. I mean, we had a major issue with the, with Syria, where a lot of a lot of Syrian refugees came to Europe. But the Syrian refugees coming to Europe, it was really a tiny minority of the Syrians who came to Europe. A tiny country like Lebanon that has only five million people as inhabitants took two million people. Uh, Turkey, which is eighty million, took around one or two million uh, refugees. So the, the ones that are actually reaching the shores and the borders of European are, are really a tiny well, so, minority. So why don't we ask Charlotte this, since your job is liaising with refugees um, in, in Denmark. There's plenty of space, isn't there, uh, for camps to be built with proper facilities. Denmark is not a poor country. Um, everybody could be processed there. Yes, they could, and, uh, and they should, should. I think we need to remember here that we have a global asylum system that uh, works to a very large degree, and that the majority of, of refugees around the world are actually hosted by neighboring countries to the conflicts, meaning uh, poor or middle-income countries uh, very close to the conflict zones where people flee from. from. So if we want a well-functioning international system we in the Western world and in Europe, including in Europe, must show the solidarity uh, towards uh, these countries that actually host the majority of refugees uh, globally. And showing solidarity is receiving our relatively limited part of asylum seekers in, uh, in Denmark. Okay. Now the government is proposing a policy whereby if you are an asylum seeker coming from the Middle East or any country in Asia, to the borders of Europe, of, of Denmark seeking asylum, you will be detained and sent off to Rwanda for processing of your asylum. Well, I'll, uh, I'll get your thoughts your on whether this is actually ever going to happen towards the end of the programme, and we're, we're running out of time a little bit. I apologise for that. This is what Filippo Grandi, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, said in, in June of last year. A UNHCR strongly opposes efforts that seek to externalize or outsource asylum and international protection obligations to other countries. Such efforts to evade responsibility run counter to the letter and spirit of the 1951 Refugee Convention, as well as the Global Compact on Refugees, where countries agreed to share more equitably the responsibility for refugee protection. Dita, it's very long-winded, but basically it means uh, Denmark isn't playing by the rules. Uh, yes, that's true, and, and I think it's also important to note that this is also uh, you, you'll get exactly the, si the same line of criticism if, if if you ask for sort of the the EU's 
uh, formal uh, position on this. So, so Denmark is also running counter uh, what the EU think is the right thing to do here, and and it, that is possible for Denmark because we have an opt out on this uh, policy area. And sorry, I think could you explain that Denmark has an opt out? It doesn't have to play by the rules. Exactly. So Denmark has uh, several uh, opt-outs on, on EU policy that was uh, negotiated in the 90s as part of um, Denmark um, joining the European Union. And, and, and asylum and migration is, is one area where Denmark uh, does not uh, or sort of is exempted from uh, EU regulation. So that's, that's why we can uh, basically um, build these sort of models that, that counter uh, the EU uh, vision for how to deal with migration. So the but UN I, is powerless think... to do anything about this? And the EU equally? Well, they they can issue opinions on it, but but basically, uh, and and they can threaten by, um, by uh, you know, exempting Denmark from, from, from the Dublin Convention, but they have very limited say uh, because Denmark is, is yeah. not part of the EU on these uh, matters. Okay, let me bounce this one to John. Do you think Sweden will follow suit and do you think it's actually ever going to happen? Because in Britain it made all the headlines. Um, somebody got on a plane, then they were told to get off the plane again and now it's in the courts. Do you think it'll actually ever happen? Well, I hope if it does happen that we will be able to do it a little bit more smoothly than Britain. Uh, yes, this is the path of that migration is going to have and not just um, not just for the reasons already stated, but also, yes, I agree with the previous speaker that uh, the poorer countries took more migrants than the richer countries. And what we should have done in 2015 and what we should have done before and since is to help those countries uh, uh, with dealing with dealing with their asy asylum flows, not redirecting people and say, come to Europe. Uh, that was the least economically efficient way. We have only so many resources. We only have we have so many asylum seekers, so many people who would like a better life, and that's another important point. Yeah. So, so Awad, there you, there you are, came. Awad, you you came to Europe looking for a better life. I understand you believe that that you got it. What sort of day will it be for Denmark, the, your adopted country, if one person or twenty people or, or even more are put on a plane to Rwanda? What will you think of Denmark then? Well, I think it's a question of perspective and what t Denmark is turning into. I mean, it's a world that is uh, ridden with conflict and crisis. And unfortunately, I mean, Denmark, even though I love Denmark and, and I appreciate all the time that I have been here, but Denmark is one of those countries who are actually producing these conflicts. I mean, it, Denmark has been in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, and uh, now they are in Mali, Western Africa. And they have also been in Syria. So the, the question is much more about how are we engaging with the rest of the world? Are we creating the problems for ourselves by being part of wars that are creating refugees and that are coming back to haunt us here in Europe? I mean, we have to talk about this issue on a much larger scale because it's not a question of where we're going to place these asylum seekers and refugees, but a question is what are the underlying causes for those refugees? Why are they fleeing? And what is our role in these conflicts? This is the real uh, core of the issue that is not being discussed in Denmark or in any other European countries. We're just seeing these menacing people who are trying to reach the, our borders because they want a safer yeah. life. Okay, sorry, but, I'm going to gonna flip to, to Charlotte, if I may, I would, um, and ask you, if it comes to this, if people are told they have to get on a plane and they're being flown south uh, to Rwanda, do you think there will be disobedience. Would you encourage people to refuse to go? I don't think we would be in a position to do that. We basically provide legal advice and we provide support to asylum seekers that come to Denmark and we provide support around the globe. But I think it, it would be a very sad day for, for Denmark, but also for the global asylum system, if that day should occur, that we actually have this uh, model in place. We are very concerned about the human rights abuses that would be connected with such a model for the people who are involved. We have seen in similar models applied elsewhere in the world that actually there is a deficit of uh, respect for these people's rights. There is a delay in asylum uh, processes. There is a lack of access to legal advice. There is a lack of access to services in such uh, models. So we would be extremely concerned. 
uh, for the asylum seekers that would be part of uh, trying out such a Appreciate model. Your time. And we don't believe, and we don't believe that it would actually do the trick that the Danish government calls uh, talks about here, okay. dismantling the business model of the human smugglers, because people who are in need for seeking asylum because they are uh, personally persecuted or uh, fleeing conflict or war would need to seek refuge, would need to seek asylum in some place. It would just not be Denmark, it would be other countries uh, around the world. So we believe that Denmark should uphold the uh, international solidarity for finding global solutions to the, to the refugee uh, situation around the world. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to stop you. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. We've, we've, we've run out of time. Thank you so much. I sometimes feel like I'm being rude, but I'm being told that we have no more time. And, of course, if you only have a certain amount of time on television, the programme will just end. Thank you for coming on this one, this edition of Roundtable. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps it will just be kicked into the long grass. It won't actually happen. It's just being used as a political tool, I wonder. See you next time, I hope. Bye-bye.